This is KGW News at Noon. What I'm trying to do is just open a conversation. Okay, whether you like guns or don't like, don't like guns, um, your kids can be exposed somewhere. And so that's that is the man who has made it his mission to educate kids on gun safety. And now he's backing legislation that would allow schools in Oregon to teach gun safety in the classroom. Good afternoon to you. Thanks for being here. I'm Chris Willis. Let's get started with Christine Pitawanich looking at the details of that bill. And Christine, it's being discussed today in Salem. Chris, yes, there is a public hearing at one o'clock today, and the idea of this bill is to teach kids about gun safety. I spoke with a man who came up with the legislation with the help of other legislators. He says all he wants to do is protect children, not indoctrinate them. Guns, they can be the subject of heated debate, but guns themselves aren't necessarily at issue in this proposed legislation. It's gun safety education. Whether you like guns or don't like, don't like guns, um, your kids can be exposed somewhere. That's why Derek That's LeBlanc came up with the idea to allow schools in Oregon to teach first graders about gun safety. Statistics drives everything that we do. And so from about four to eight, that's where our kids are most vulnerable. The proposed bill says the 30 minute class would have to be taught by a teacher, administrator, law enforcement officer, or first responder. It wouldn't involve any real guns and would teach kids how to respond if they encounter one. LeBlanc, through his nonprofit Kids Safe Foundation, has already reached 15,000 kids in Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. Taught them those life saving skills, which is stop, don't touch, run away, tell a grown up. Some parents say they're all for the idea. And I feel comfortable with uh, kids learning about gun safety in school um, in order to be safe in case they do encounter a situation. Others are worried about opinions making their way into the classroom. It's too hard for a teacher to not put their opinions in. But LeBlanc says for him, it's not about pushing guns. It's about pushing safety. I had this idea on a Sunday um, in a coffee shop. Um, in December, and that night there was a kid that died 20 minutes from my house. And so this is something that, you know, is my fuel, you know, to, to keep going and to make sure that I can reach those ones that do need, need our help. So if past schools would also talk about the difference between video game violence and real life violence, and if parents don't want their kids to participate, they can opt out again that public hearing at one o'clock in Salem. But again, this legislation still in the beginning stages and it still has a long way to go. Back to you. All right, Christine Pitawanich, thank you for that. We want to know what you think. Should schools teach gun safety to first graders? You can vote right now in our viewer voice poll. Just go to KGW.com slash vote or click on the vote now tab in our KGW news app. We'll take a look at your results later on in this newscast. The teenager at the center of this viral video will be sentenced this afternoon. Taylor Smith pushed her friend off a Washington bridge last summer, and the case got national attention. She pleaded guilty last week to reckless endangerment. That plea deal was in exchange for house arrest and community service. As for the girl pushed off the bridge, her name is Jordan Holgerson. She spent time in the hospital with a punctured lung and broken ribs. Police say a registered sex offender known as the TriMet Barber has struck again. His crimes have been much worse than just cutting hair, and now he's behind bars again. This is the guy who has a 10-year history of doing offensive things to female riders. More now live from KGW's Tim Gordon here at Pioneer Courthouse Square. Tim, give us the details. Well, Chris, we know that Jared Walter was arrested here at the Yamhill Max platform yesterday for what he allegedly did to a woman on a train the day before. She came forward and Jared Walter will be in court this afternoon. This is the latest mugshot for 32-year-old Jared Weston Walter. If you've been around for long, you'll probably recognize him. Walter has a 10-year history of doing some awful things, including cutting, gluing, or ejaculating into women's hair on TriMet buses. This time, he was on a train, a frustration for police, according to Sergeant Brad Yakuts. Yes, but uh, we continue to do it. It's pretty ridiculous, over 20 or almost 20 arrests, and we will continue to arrest him each time. We're working with the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office to make sure these charges go through. Walter was released from the Washington County Jail just last November. He was behind bars for a similar incident in 2017. This time, he faces several charges, including sex abuse and sexual harassment. We need to talk with police and learn a little bit more about what happened. 
Roberta Allstott says TriMet has the authority to ban Walter for life with rules developed because of him. But what about right now? Mr. Walter is in jail right now, and when he was arrested by transit police officers yesterday, they also gave him a 90-day exclusion from the TriMet system. So if he does get out of jail after his arraignment today, he would still be banned from riding transit. So you may be wondering why no transit ban already. Well, the answer is TriMet came up with the tougher rules based on Walter's 2017 incident. It couldn't use those rules retroactively, but Chris, it can certainly use them now and they don't need a conviction to do it. So stand by. Back to you. Be nice to have that conviction though. All right, considering the history. Tim Gordon, thank you. A dangerous morning for drivers with police responding to several crashes. Let's start with this one, SR 14, all lanes blocked near milepost 23 due to this semi truck rollover. Eastbound traffic is being stopped at milepost 19 and westbound traffic is being stopped near the bridge of the gods. The semi was hauling plywood, which you can see spilled onto the road. Deputies say it could take a while to clean up that mess. Meantime, firefighters spent the morning cleaning up after a car crashed into a semi near Northeast 122nd and Marine Drive. As you can see, the semi ended up on its side, the car heavily damaged. Portland police say the drivers were taken to the hospital. They say one person does have serious injuries, but good news should be okay. In Washington County, a horse died after it was hit by a truck. Deputies say the horse was on the road being boarded into a trailer near Southwest Tongue Lane and 329th place. The driver of the truck was taken to the hospital, but again is expected to be okay. Take a look at these flames. A car caught on fire on I-84 this morning happened near the exit ramp to Northeast 238th Drive. We don't know what caused that fire, but we're told the driver is okay. Wow. The exit ramp was closed for about an hour as crews put out those flames. Washington State is launching an interactive database showing buildings that could collapse during an earthquake. Right now, it lists nearly 4,500 at-risk buildings statewide, 360 of those right in Clark County. You can search for these locations by county or by city. Oregon recently released a similar study and found more than 5,000 unreinforced brick buildings across the state. All right, shifting gears, live look at our Wells Fargo sky cam, and you can see a little bit of rain coming in, clouds lingering around. Meteorologist Rod Hill is tracking rain for us this afternoon, Rod. Well, at sunrise, we said noon. That's kind of the go time, we thought, for the chances of rain to really start taking off. And if you have plans this afternoon, it's going to be wet. Quick look at the larger radar picture. You can see it all sweeping in over the past hour or so coming up from the south. Most areas are, in fact, now reporting some rain. Uh, so far, nothing stormy about any of this, and it's mostly light rain. A few heavier pockets where you see the yellows down just south of uh, King City and down around Oregon City. Pretty steady from Salem all the way down to Albany at lunchtime. Uh, Pacific City camera, again, the rain at the beach so far has been really light. 55 degrees is the temperature there. Here's a look at more of a, a rainy <laughs> view from the Stoller Family Vineyards Estate. Looks like a little wind down there. We are getting east winds coming out of the gorge. Some of the windier spots could see some of those winds mainly out in East Multnomah County to about 35 miles per hour. That rain cooled temperature out the Stoller family vineyard 47 degrees right now. Here's the Oregon Garden from Silverton. You can see the wet pavement right there where it's uh, turned into a wet afternoon as well. And the Rose City camera. It's really light stuff right now in downtown Portland. We're at 56. Rain at times through the afternoon. Here we are at 3 o'clock on Futurecast. Some heavier pockets around. Temperatures will basically be holding steady in the low to mid 50s. We have some snow up in the Cascades, Chris. We'll take a look at those cas uh, Cascade Pass cameras coming up shortly. Yeah, I'm already looking forward to Saturday. I'll see you for the extended seven day forecast in just a bit, Rod. Thank you. All right, take a look at this. Portland police need your help to find this man. He is 64 year old Alan Salois. They say he suffers from dementia. Last seen on Monday near his care home in the 4400 block of Northeast 38th Avenue. If you see him, take a good look. You're asked to call 911. We are learning new details about this riot caught on cell phone video at Geyser Middle School in Vancouver earlier this month. Vancouver Public Schools say it all started with a confrontation between three students at a basketball tournament. The district says the incident quickly escalated, obviously, and about 50 students got involved. More than 30 officers responded. Things got violent. 
According to court documents, a teenager pushed and punched a school security officer and then fought back when police chased him down. In total, nine students arrested, 28 others emergency expelled. It is still unclear exactly what started the riot in the first place. Police also need your help identifying a few suspicious characters in Happy Valley. Take a look at this. They were caught on home surveillance video. You can see at least three people go driveway to driveway, peeking in the windows of cars and testing door handles. This happened Thursday night near Southeast 152nd and Misty Drive. Fortunately, the homeowner who captured this video had his cars locked. Police can ask other neighbors to do the same. If you recognize any of those suspects, you're encouraged to call the number on your screen. A Vancouver woman is getting credit for helping solve a decades old murder, all because she wanted to learn more about her ancestry. KGW's Mike Benner explains how a simple DNA test led authorities to a suspected killer. This is the last thing I ever thought would happen. <laughs> Brandy Jennings says it was early last summer that she decided she wanted to learn more about her family, specifically her dad's side of the family. My dad died in 2009 and my parents divorced when I was four and a half and we moved out of state. So I didn't really know my dad that well. Like so many people these days, Jennings uploaded her DNA profile to the genealogy website GED Match. She forgot about it until late last week. And then I started getting messages from people in Iowa saying, are you related to Jerry Burns? 65-year-old Jerry Burns of Manchester, Iowa, arrested in December for the 1979 murder of then 18-year-old Michelle Martinko. I guess it was a really vicious and just unnecessary killing, you know, the way it happened. And chances are it would still be unsolved had it not been for Jennings and her desire to learn more about her family. She says the DNA she submitted to the genealogy website partially matched the suspected killer's DNA that investigators had uploaded to the site. That partial DNA match gave detectives the evidence they needed to zero in on Jerry Burns, a distant relative of Brandy Jennings. I'm glad. I mean, I'm really glad I did it because, you know, that I, I like true crime and stuff, but I can't imagine being the family not knowing for 39 years, you know, what happened. A decades-old murder in Iowa solved thanks in large part to a woman in Vancouver, Washington. He probably never thought he would get caught, you know? 40 years he went without ever getting caught, so. Mike Benner for KGW News.